corporals have been saying for some time that he was going to shoot himself in the foot. He, he got past it and he, he'd, he'd have to go and we'd all, I'll be honest, we've made a, quite a bit of fun about it. This had been going on since Christmas. And he came up and had his head down. He'd, come, he'd obviously come in from botanic ward, I suppose. And uh, I called down to him because we, we, we were jeering him up all the time and said, how about it then? Whatever his name was. And he called back and he said, tonight's the night. And I said, oh yeah, heard that before. Anyway, stand to, well, nothing happens during stand to, but stand down, just as it's called, there's a shot. And of course he's, he has done the business. He's done it quite well too, really. He's, uh, he's had a stem and he's jabbed his bayonet in his leg and pulled the trigger and shot himself in the foot. He had him on the back of the trench there. The MO was brought up because he was, it was such a, we were such a tight perimeter that he could come up. MO came up and uh, he's treating him, you know, got him there. I heard later, funny enough, that a friend of his also did the same thing that night. So there were two of them must have perhaps had a little pact. Anyway, he's laid there. And <laughs> As he's laying there, he suddenly said, I'll never make sergeant now. And it was too much for me, I laughed. And the MO said, quiet that man, this is a serious situation. And I crept away. But I, I really always thought that was, that was quite an abusing thing from somebody who deliberately just shot themselves to say, I'll never make sergeant now. And the rather abusing thing was, I, when I eventually saw him again in Hong Kong at the end of the war, I said, how'd you get on then, you know, SIW, because it's not a very popular way to be wounded. And uh, he said, oh, I tore the label off uh, on the way down that they, they put it on, you know, a self-inflicted wound. He tore it off. He said, when I got down, they said, where's the label? Where's the label? I said, oh, how were you shot? I've shot for a sniper. He said, so he, he, he got away with it like that. It, it, it didn't do him any harm, in actual fact. But uh, people reach the limit of their endurance and... It's a brave man who could shoot himself in the foot. It's not a, not a terribly pleasant thing to do. I never felt any uh, feelings against him or, or any of the others that, that uh, faded away out of it. Not, not at all, not then or afterwards. Some people do. I've met people since who are very upset about certain situations, but who can? I don't know. Anyway, that night went off quietly. And uh, the following that night, we got thick fog came down over the uh, over the area. Very cold, very thick, freezing fog. And when it lifted in the morning, one of the Chinese that, that uh, was laying in front of us, well, I guess 200 yards in front of us, I suppose, as we were up on the hill, he vanished. So whether or not he wasn't dead when C Company turned him over, or whether or not they'd come, their old trick of coming out and taking the dead, they'd like to remove all their dead, and, of course, it's supposed to frighten you to death if they come out and sneak out and take uh, uh, one of their dead away. And I pointed it out to our chaps. He's gone. And none of them could even remember seeing him. So, you know, it, it hadn't worked very well if it was uh, supposed to frighten us a bit. But unfortunately, during the night, the, um, the, all the Chinese dead that were around the trees about two or three hundred yards out, it was obvious that they died but during the night. The cold had just done for them. And my little friend that I'd gone down to try to help, he was dead as well. But uh, there had been also another four, uh, four platoon had been had rather a lot of unpleasant, uh, uh, gruesome bodies to bury. And one of their lance corporals during the night, this is the, the night that's gone, he'd broken down and he had to be stretched away. He was a, I don't know what he was doing here for, but he was an ex-bandsman actually, uh, drummer. Uh, bugler fellow and in fact I've, I've seen him in many photographs since but he, he had to be carted away because he'd broken down and I went down in the valley and I found a sleeping bag thrown down there um, with obviously somebody had been caught in a sleeping bag and shot there were about four shots in it and quite a bit of blood around and uh, there had been some rumours that some of them had been caught in there asleep in their sleeping bags and killed there but I mean they were only rumours I don't know if they're true but all I can say is I did see a bloodstained sleeping bag which had obviously been thrown away to hide it from, uh, from anybody looking at it 
during the course of that day, I saw um, Chris Lawrence, the second lieutenant Chris Lawrence, uh, who was four platoon commander, going down towards Badan HQ. And uh, when he came back, I'd heard that I heard in the meantime that he was going down to be told that he'd uh, been awarded the military cross for his actions on the Nacton and, and the capture of Plum Pudding Hill. Well deserved, very, very well deserved. And uh, when he came back, I said to him, I called out and I said, Where's the ribbon then? And he, What? <laughs> he was a bit embarrassed by it all, so I shut up and let him go. But that was a well deserved military cross that he got there. And uh, we stayed there a few days, pretty cold. And the Argars came up on our right and got ahead of us. The Australians got up on our left, had to fight. The Australians had to fight all the way. The Argars didn't. And I, I as I remember, the um, uh, Six Rock were over again on the right flank and they were slowly moving up. And we got so that where we'd been a V, where we were the tip of the V forward, we were now the base of the V back, who we were literally the, the uh, reserve um, battalion. Very stiff fighting on the Australian side. And because the rumours rum abound, don't they? And uh, it was rumoured that they were desperate to get forward because they'd seen some jeeps that they wanted to scrounge. Uh, American abandoned jeeps. Anyway, the, 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 the uh, Chinese began to... Um, literally melt away in actual fact they just began to melt away it was really common that sort of happened I suppose it happened on both sides and they were withdrawing and the word came that we were going to go forward and uh, into Chorni itself and clear Chorni we went down we were called down onto the road we had to abandon quite a bit of stuff actually we took our, our captured um, weapons down and the colour sergeant wanted to please and said, well, all right, I'll put him on the wagon, but I suspect he just left him on the side of the road. I kept my M1, but it was so heavy and uh, cumbersome, and we started to march uh, up, the, uh, up the main road. The, the road was clear by now. We came to a spot where a couple of days before uh, we'd, been, we'd seen a Chinese going through the motions of laying mines, digging little holes, or supposedly digging little holes, putting something in it, and because there were, by this time, there were a couple of tanks back there that, had, that uh, I guess they were concerned they might uh, might uh, make a breakthrough. And as we came to this spot, we were a bit careful because uh, the guns had fired him. They, he was out the range of our um, LMGs, but the uh, 16 field had put a couple of shots over and he sort of vanished in a, in a cloud of smoke. But I, I don't think they hit him. I think he got away. I, think, I don't think he had any mines. I think it was just a ruse. And uh, they were very accurate, 16 field. And they were saying, the FFO had told me, that uh, they were restricted with ammunition and they were only allowed one shot for ranging. And they reckoned that they could fire two, th out of three shots, they were expected to get the third onto a slit trench. I think that's probably a bit of an exaggeration, but, uh, but they were pretty close. They were very, very good. Anyway, we marched through the, into the village and we saw some Americans. They were prisoners. Apparently the Chinese had... Uh, had abandoned them and uh, they'd kept them in this hut which of course we'd been shelling that village or our guns had been shelling that village so they were very lucky but they, they were looking pretty uh, pretty downcast and we, we we went on then through the village and uh, we passed through a, a scene where the uh, the two American companies apparently had been withdrawing uh, when the Chinese attacked them and they just called them in the open. I, I don't know how many dead there were there. Um, later reports said 80 or 90. And I, I wouldn't doubt that at all. Mainly black lads there were. Their boots had been taken off and uh, they'd been robbed of their socks. Uh, you'll see, incidentally, if you read histories and stories about this, they'd been robbed of their boots. Quite wrong. Boots are too big for any Chinese foot. It was the socks they were after. And the boots were actually by the side of them. And somebody called out and said, don't touch them, they're probably booby traps. So we left them. But I guess people coming in on behind whipped the boots and then everybody thought they'd, uh, they'd stolen the boots. There were devil a lot of them there. Like. One of the most peculiar things was that a lot of the black lads had a, like a boot lace tied around one ankle. I can't remember which, left or right, one or the other. I guess it was some sort of uh, um, token that 
keep them safe. Unfortunately, it didn't. My M1's weighing me down now, so I chuck that out to them as well. All the arms are gone. And there were two ju- jeeps, two might have been three jeeps in line, uh, facing towards us, empty of everything, on the side of the road. And uh, and I, I guess this had probably been done by the Chinese. I don't th- don't think it's true. But standing behind one of the jeeps was a young American officer, blonde hair. He was as if he's climbing into the back of this jeep. His hands were on the back of the jeep. His one leg was up, and he was dressed only in long johns. And he was frozen solid, and there was a, a blood red patch in the middle of his back. And I, I can only imagine that um, uh, he, he had been stood up there by the Chinese. I imagine, I don't know that, I imagine that's what happened. But it did, unfortunately, bring a, a story later from the Canadians, which is uh, which they've written up that uh, the Americans have been caught in their pajamas and, and shot down trying to climb into their jeeps. And nothing of the sort. They weren't in pajamas at all. Although, unfortunately, of course, we did find a lot of them in the houses where they've been uh, where they've been killed. The houses have then been built, uh, burnt around them, and they, there were a lot of dead bodies in the houses. We went forward to the crossroads, and my section was told to go over and clear the the right flank there and we went over and we found a, a little gully there a little um depression depression in the ground and it was obvious that a 50 caliber machine gun had been uh, uh, parked there at some time so that meant it was an american post which i guess they put out and of course the usual big fire had been there and uh, they'd obviously had this going and I guess they must have been surprised with the Chinese and taken prisoner without a shot because there were a lot of footprints all around the edge and they just cut them and the gun off. I mean, the, the fire would have attracted anybody in. And one supposes once that had gone, they, they went into the village and uh, slaughtered the guys who who were, uh, we, we believed, asleep in the village without too many sentries out. I can't go along with the pyjama bit. I think it's this poor lad in his comms, but... Uh, there we are. Anyway, we went up, um, climbed up above the village, six platoon, and we dug in on the top of this uh, crest there. Nothing happened. Uh, Chip Yong Ni, the, the place that we were supposedly trying to get through, had been relieved by a, an armoured column with terrible casualties, I might add, not to the tanks, but to the people who arrived on the outside. And that is another story. And uh, we, we, uh, we stayed there. Overnight, this would have been the 19th, I think, 18th, 18th, that's right. And the following morning, um, John Swarbrick called me over and said that uh, he'd been relieved. He was going, I can't remember if he was going off to be 2IC of the company or MTO, one or the other. He was going off and he left me in command of the platoon and said there'd be a new platoon commander along uh, sometime during the morning. Anyway, I, you do the normal things that you do. Uh, looking after the platoon because we had no platoon sergeant we had had a platoon sergeant since uh, Gus was killed at Chongju at uh, yes Chongju and um, I was squatted there it was rather funny really because the, the, all the, the Korean men older men they squat on their heels and uh, they could squat there for hours it seemed they never seemed to beat their heads and I'd, I'd adopted this, and quite a number of us had adopted this. We couldn't do it for more than, say, half an hour or something like that. But it keeps your bottom off the cold ground, and presumably in the summer, the wet ground. And it's, it's quite a, a way you could squat down. I was squatting down there at the top of the path where I knew the platoon, platoon commander had come up. And I saw him start to climb up the hill. As he got a few uh, yards up the hill, I thought, gosh, I know who that is. That's Rex Kane. We've been in training together. And sure enough, it was Rex Kane. He was a um, graduate, so when he passed out, he automatically became a lieutenant. So unfortunately, although completely inexperienced, he's senior to the people like uh, uh, Chris Lawrence. But that's the way the army operates. Anyway, he came up, and uh, I could see he was having difficulty getting up the hill because he was never very uh, good at uh, climbing, not very good at all. And we got to the, uh, he came up there and he looked, put his head up and looked at me and I could see he wanted to say, hello, Don, but he obviously, we both stopped ourselves and he, he said, oh, good morning, Cobblewell. How funny seeing you here. That's a similar thing. 
introduced him to the um, to the section commanders, the other two section commanders, three section commanders, and uh, no platoon sergeant because I'm acting platoon sergeant. You, you don't have very ma- hardly any duties to do, but you act when you haven't got one. And he told me that uh, we've got a platoon sergeant. I didn't know the chap, the new chap. He was apparently um, a uh, had been colour sergeant of C Company. He was Middlesex and had been with a tanner, but he appointed colour sergeant of C Company, and he'd been busted for some reason. 